I believe if you come into this video with the right mindset, you will leave excited for Halo's future. But before that future can be realized, we need to journey out of this honeymoon phase with Halo Infinite and start really getting into the nuts and bolts of what this game is. Regarding the title, I think it is beyond justifiable to consider this game a disappointment. It is not hyperbole, it is not an over-exaggeration, and I plan to be very thorough in explaining to you why I feel this is the case. As we begin, I feel compelled to mention that since early 2019, I have been a part of a secret group of community members called the Forerunners who were put together to play and provide feedback on Halo Infinite both in the studio and at home. I was not paid for this, though I did have various things such as travel and sleeping accommodations provided. This was truly an incredible experience. Everyone I got to meet both in the program and at the studio have been fantastic, and I look forward to continuing that journey into the future. But the reason I bring it up is because that group, at least for me, was about giving feedback. I believe that if what I say is honestly what I feel and I have sound reasoning for it, then that is what I will say. The, the principles that I base my feedback on do not change whether I'm giving it privately or publicly, and this video is simply a continuation of my ongoing feedback. And to tie it into my past arguments, in my video Why Halo Struggles to Evolve, we discussed what I called the five avenues of innovations. You have the player, which are like your base mechanics, you have the environment, which is map design and dynamic elements, the sandbox, which are weapons, vehicles, equipment, etc. The AI, which are more like enemy behaviors, and that's not really something we're going to touch on too much today because this is primarily multiplayer focused. And lastly, you have objectives, which are your game modes, settings, etc. If you haven't seen that video, don't worry about it. But for those who have, you will be able to connect the dots and see that those same principles are at work here and will guide us as we finally shift our minds to Halo Infinite. And we should start with the player. The, this channel for a long time has preached the idea that Halo should be a sandbox driven game, as opposed to say Halo 5, which was very player driven. It gave the mechanics to you. You could thrust, hover, Spartan charge, ground pound, etc. Halo Infinite is mechanically and from a gameplay perspective, the closest that 343 has ever been to Halo's original formula. It is a sandbox driven game. It's even starts a very obvious emphasis has been put on finding things in the environment, and their arguably biggest addition, the equipment, are on-map pickups. BTB, a mode that really utilizes all of these sandbox elements, has returned and is from a player count standpoint bigger than ever. Weapons have far more flavor and unique mechanics attached to them, and while it still has some holdovers like clamber, sprint, and slide, the total amount of abilities given to the player has been reduced. You can no longer hover, you can no longer ground pound or spartan charge, and even sprint, an ability that is still present in the game has had its effectiveness significantly reduced. You have a simplified set of mechanics, an emphasis on the sandbox, maps designed for both small and large engagements, and how have people responded? They fucking love it. When people say Halo's back, I believe this is what they're referring to. This core, this lifeblood, this magic that courses through those original Halo games is here in Infinite, and I personally feel very vindicated because I've been trying to say a game like this would work, and Infinite has proven that it can. No matter what I go on to say later in this video, let it be known that this gameplay at its core, and even in a quite frankly suboptimal state, still resonates with people. This formula, even with its potential being completely squandered, is still powerful enough to get the positive response it's gotten, and I'll be honest, I am one of the biggest believers in this formula, and even I am surprised by just how effective it has been after being reintroduced to the public at large. And that's why I understand why people love this game, or at least love it right now because that formula is at the forefront of the experience. So let's take a little deeper look at its mechanics. It is not nearly as advanced as Halo 5, but it is not as simple as the classic games. It still has sprint, clamber, and sliding, and that makes it very similar to almost every other first-person shooter in existence. And my preference is still that Halo should just fully embrace that pure, simple core set of mechanics that Halo 1 through 3 had. That being said, these mechanics contribute almost nothing to my overall feelings on the game. If this was a purely classic Halo game, I would call this video the exact same thing and make the exact same points. Sprint in this game has by far the smallest impact it has ever had. It is not useless, but due to how insignificant its speed boost is, the effect it might have on map design is not entirely eliminated, but it's negligible or close to it. Your combat readiness while sprinting is incredibly high. Most weapons can fire near instantaneously 
instantaneously out of sprint, and some weapons can fire instantaneously. A lot of my problems with it, like its impact on map design, its effect on moment-to-moment -moment encounters, its usefulness in escaping encounters and acting as a get-out-of-jail-free card for mistakes, all of that has been significantly reduced. You know, really, when I said all those years back that sprint couldn't work in Halo, because in order for it to not damage the game, you'd have to nerf it so hard that it almost did nothing, I didn't actually think they'd do that. And so yes, I will admit, as the community's resident sprint hater, it has yet to damage my experience or bother me all that much. I do not, however, think designing a mechanic to be insignificant is good design. 343 have identified that it is potentially harmful to the game, that's great, but they designed it as if Sprint had to be there by default, as a fixture when it didn't need to be. It is absolutely bizarre that the Halo community is in a state where we actively praise mechanics for not impacting things, when the far more elegant solution would be to remove the mechanic outright. Like if there's dog shit on the sidewalk and people keep stepping in it, pick it up. But instead of picking it up and getting rid of it, we built a bridge over it just so we can say, hey, you know, you know, at least it's still there for the people who like shit. But I guess that's just me being petty. Ironically, one of Sprint's primary uses now is to actually enable another ability, the slide. It's like a slide primer button. And slide actually has quite a bit of utility. This is the ability that will make you just go, oh man, you know, Halo Infinite's movement is nutty. You can use it to build momentum. And compared to Halo 5, I do find it more compelling, as opposed to just, hey, press this sequence of buttons to do crazy shit and fly across the map like in Halo 5, where so much of your movement was ever-present, omnidirectional, and also fairly unpredictable. The bulk of Infinite's movement tech is tied to the map geometry, and obviously in sandbox elements as well, like the grapple shot and repulsor. I think using tech revolving around the slide to build momentum and make difficult jumps or close in on an opponent is a lot more interesting than just pressing a button on your controller to accomplish the same thing. It's not only more limited, but it's also more predictable. Players have to commit and can't just back out with an ever-present thrust. It's also still very skill-testing, less likely to damage moment-to-moment -moment encounters, and in my opinion, more satisfying. When you use your environments and your surroundings, it feels more specific, and to learn and utilize those specific opportunities, I believe is good for the game. I do worry about Slide as the game goes on, though. As the game evolves and players get better, I'm worried the meta might involve it too heavily. I couldn't imagine it'd be very fun to try and shoot a player slip and sliding all over the map, especially with tech like the drop slide, which certain players are already practicing extensively. And if it becomes too optimized, where players find a way to take advantage of it consistently, then even if it is incredibly skill testing, it might simply alter the current style of engagement that is resonating so well right now. And no doubt that absurd level of movement will be awesome for some people, but others who are currently appreciating the more classic feel of the game in its infancy might not like it if that's how the game evolves. Only time will tell. Right now, I'm hoping the these tech options are limited and predictable enough to be used in a cool, semi-infrequent manner, but not necessarily in a way that will eventually define the bulk of combat encounters. Then there's Clamber. Um, I don't like it. I have a video on why. It is what it is. I don't really want to retread through everything because it's all still applicable. So at the end of the day, Halo Infinite's mechanics are fine. They do a relatively decent job of staying out of the way and letting the Halo magic happen, and the cool things they do let you do feel far more controlled and specific. I dislike how safe it is. It feels like a set of mechanics devised out of a lack of confidence, like they understood how base mechanics hurt Halo in the past, but were maybe worried a purely sandbox-driven game wouldn't be enough. So they settled on a very basic, honestly generic set of abilities and simply tried to dampen their impact, and I'm hopeful now that they've seen how great the sandbox driven experience is doing that they may feel more confident in fully embracing it. And speaking of confidence, that brings me to map design. The vast majority of maps in this game are very safe. I believe they lack confidence, as if they are designed to stay out of the way and not have too big of an impact because, oh man, if we get a little too creative here, it might not be competitive enough. And if all you care about is each map being fine, each map being passable, then I guess you can overlook this. But as a Halo game, attempting to live up to a legacy of excellence, attempting to evoke those powerful emotions this franchise has historically made people feel, this selection of maps is not 
interesting or compelling in the slightest. Let's get into why. First, a lack of diversity in the environments just from an aesthetic standpoint. This is a game set on an alien world with limitless possibilities and yet seven of the ten maps featured predominantly human architecture. There is a little bit of diversity within that human architecture like a city street at night or a town market in the day, but still I feel like it's far overrepresented. On the same note, the Pacific Northwest biome is far overrepresented here as well. I wouldn't call the aesthetic variety abysmal, but it's certainly not seizing Halo's potential. The bigger issue is the maps themselves. You could take any one map and view it in isolation and be like, yeah, you know, it's fine, I guess. But when you view all of the maps as a collection, as a total package of experiences, they fail to live up to Halo's legacy. Let's start with the BTB maps, of which there are three in Halo Infinite in its launch lineup. Fragmentation is probably my favorite of the bunch. You have your classic two-base canyon map, though instead of an open field, it's more like two paths that snake alongside each other from base to base, each path having a lower section which works for vehicles, as well as an upper section if you're traveling on foot. It's a good map, a, a tried and true formula, every Halo's gotta have one of these, no problem with it whatsoever. Next we have High Power. It's asymmetrical with two bases and a neutral field. Next up we have Deadlocked, which has two bases and a big neutral field. I don't think any of these three maps are bad, but they simply don't do enough to create a distinct experience from one another. They are formulaic, they are safe, and they are simply boxes to house the 24 players running around them playing with all the toys. Like there's nothing wrong with Deadlocked's layout. It's a two base map with an outer track that you could drive around vehicles with. There's some trenches in the middle of the terrain that you can cut through, it's just a, you know, it's your standard BTB map. Even the big giant cannon that looks awesome is just set dressing, you can't even get on top of it without Without getting prompted with a soft kill barrier. And it may sound like I'm being an overcritical asshat, but I think when I remind you of what Halo maps used to do, you'll understand my point a bit more. Remember, map design is an avenue of innovation. It is an opportunity to provide and create gameplay, not to simply house it. It is an opportunity to give players an experience they've never had before, and I don't believe a single map in Halo Infinite does that. Where is the variety in these layouts? What about maps like Relic that utilize a large neutral structure that splits the island in half? What about maps like Zanzibar, which are designed as asymmetrical one-sided objective maps, where one team starts on a beach and must infiltrate and assault a facility occupied by an enemy team featuring dynamic elements such as the wheel, which doesn't just look good on a thumbnail before the game loads, but actually has gameplay ramifications and interactions. What about maps like The Spire, which feature completely unique interactions and encounters across an incredibly vertical structure, and the fantasy that promotes of assaulting said spire with a falcon or jumping from the top all the way down on top of an unsuspecting opponent. It's not good enough for Halo's maps to be competent, they have to be excellent. They have to define gameplay, or at least some of them do. Instead, Infinite identified one style of map that has worked for Halo in the past and used that as the template for its entire BTB experience, but all of these other other types of experience that Halo used to provide are few and far between, and they're sure as shit nothing new. Let's look at Halo Infinite's smaller maps. You have Aquarius, a competitive mirrored symmetry kill box. You have Bazaar, a mirrored symmetry kill box, basically divided into three sections with a relatively open courtyard. Streets and Live Fire are both your industry bog standard three lane maps, with Live Fire being egregiously generic and uninspired. There's Recharge, a decent asymmetrical map that plays like a giant wheel with a no man's land in the middle, but the map does a good job with the different layers of elevation and the natural cover that creates in order to actually make traversing that middle section viable. It also features one of the few distinct interactive elements on a map with these pistons that uh, occasionally move up and down. And, you know, I guess that's something. And the last two maps are arguably the most interesting. Behemoth is, to me, not the best competitive map, but it's a really good map for Halo. It's got a good layout, it's got vehicles, which is cool to see again on 4v4, it utilizes man cannons, and really it's one of maybe two or three maps in the game that I look at and think to myself, that's Halo. It evokes strong Halo imagery, Halo gameplay principles, and to me, even though it doesn't do too many new things, it does what it does well and is the most interesting map in the game. 
For launch site, its layout is different, but it's wasted because it's too big for 4v4 and too small for 12v12. It might have been okay with its half loop design and even filled a little bit of that one sided objective style hole the game has and desperately needs more of, but as of now, it feels like a victim of BTB's shift to a larger player count. So there you have it. 10 maps, and yes, that's low for Halo. That's less than Halo 1 through 3, and without Forge to bolster its ranks, it feels even worse. But the bigger problem is, there isn't a single big idea in the whole lot. There is no innovation in this map design. There are no super distinct layouts. There are no attempts at creating specific gameplay fantasies. There is a lack of visual diversity, and there is a lack of distinct interactive elements outside of the pistons on recharge, and I guess you could count the loot caves where you press a button Button to open a door. They are a static collection of shapes. You know what Infinite's maps lack? Character. Outside of maybe one or two exceptions, they are formulaic, safe, and do nothing to create new distinct Halo experiences. And it's one thing for you to not be bothered by this, but how can it be praised? How can this be considered a return to form? Yeah, sure, Halo's back, but then it went backwards. I challenge you to go look at those old Halo games and their initial roster of maps. It is astonishing just how different each one was from another, both visually and in the type of gameplay they provided. Sure, Halo 3 had the pit, a great map, and you see a lot of its design principles in a lot of what 343 builds. But maybe the pit was only the pit because the pit was the only pit. Maybe the pit is only revered because it was surrounded by a selection of maps that were vastly different from it and offered a unique experience. Sure, you had the pit, your old reliable 4v4 map, and Valhalla, your tried and true two base canyon map, nothing wrong with that, but then you had Guardian which was an asymmetrical bridge work map, legendary to this day. High Ground is a small-scale, one-sided OBJ map with a strong fantasy of assaulting a base with interactive elements such as a gate you could open to let vehicles in. Then you have a BTB version of that concept with Last Resort. Epitaph is a large interior atrium with exterior catwalks snaking along the side. Construct, a 4v4 map with a giant ground level and multiple lifts that take you up to a floating upper level in the shape of a ring, and it's so unique I don't even know how to describe it. Narrows, holy shit narrows. Talk about smart design. It is so simple. It is literally just linear aggression. Two teams fighting over a narrow bridge that features a slight arch to break sight lines. Man cannons on either side for awesome gameplay potential and interactions with players fighting on top mid, and you have a classic. Despite its simplicity, it is unique and still plays like nothing else out there. Sand Trap, it's a large neutral structure half buried in the sand with plenty of space for vehicles to bob and weave and through and around. But more importantly, you have the elephants. This is a completely unique dynamic element where each team gets a mobile base that houses the objective. That is so fucking cool. It creates unique gameplay, it promotes a gameplay fantasy, and it has character. And I'll even throw in fucking veto this shit Snowbound. This is one of Halo 3's least liked maps, and it is still more interesting than 90 9% of what Halo Infinite has to offer. It's a small two base map with open terrain for vehicular combat, but what's cool is that each base is connected by subterranean tunnels that also connect to various entry points. And there were shield doors and one way glass, and even the map boundaries were creative, in that if you tried to venture out too far, there were these turrets that would kill you. Even classic Halo's bad maps had character. So do you notice the variety in both the small scale and BTB maps here? And that's just Halo 3. What about Ivory Tower from Halo 2? Or Boarding Action from Halo 1? Or Ascension? Or Hang 'em High? Or Damnation? Or Prisoner? Or Headlong? And I'm not even talking about ideas in various DLC maps. I'm just talking about the diversity that has historically been on offer on day one of past Halo experiences. Experiences generated by its map design because I don't know how else to show you that Halo Infinite doesn't have it. Halo Infinite's maps do not have nearly enough character, nearly enough aesthetic variety, nearly enough diversity of gameplay experiences from map to map, they have virtually no dynamic map interactions which is a giant missed opportunity, and they absolutely, unequivocally, without any room for debate, offer nothing new. 
Halo is a series with legendary map design. Its small competitive maps like Midship and The Pit were surrounded by unique experiences provided by other maps, and its large two-base canyon-style BTB maps were surrounded by other maps that offered something completely different. The experiences offered by their collection of launch maps absolutely dwarfs Halo Infinite in addition to having more maps on offer to boot. Infinite has no such selection, and its collection is pitifully short of living up to Halo standards, a standard I am not afraid to hold it to. And now that I've hopefully jogged your memory of what Halo's map design used to provide for the series, we can hold Infinite to a higher standard as well and call its map selection exactly what I believe it is, disappointing. Even if you like these maps, surely you can see the gulf between the two. Surely you can see how different things used to be and why people might find it disappointing. And now we move on to the sandbox. That's pretty important in a sandbox-driven game. And this is another aspect of Infinite that has been praised to the high heavens. And you know what? I have some praise too. This is certainly, at least in my opinion, 343's most interesting sandbox. At just a fundamental level, this is the direction Halo needs to continue in. You have the bulk of innovation being introduced as on-map pickups, whether it be weapons or equipment, and thus they are controllable and can be inserted into the scenarios they benefit the game and removed when they are deemed disruptive. The equipment has proven to be a massive success, and items like the grapple shot and repulsor have proven to be great additions that all have interesting ways of interacting with other sandbox elements, in addition to the inherent benefits they give the player. For instance, the grapple has obvious uses in that it can get you to higher elevations with ease, but you can also use it to pick up other weapons, pull yourselves towards other players, pick up fusion coils, hijack vehicles, and so on. That interaction is quintessential Halo, and is in my opinion, the heart of this series' potential. Not just innovating via the sandbox with new additions, but by creating interactions within the sandbox. I would say the Grapple and Repulsor both do that, and it's fitting that those are far and away the most popular and well-regarded piece of equipment in the game. I think the rest of the equipment selection is completely underwhelming. The thruster is fine, uh, the threat sensor is, while occasionally useful, relatively uninteresting, and the drop wall is so utterly useless that it probably gets people killed more than it helps at this point. To round it out, the transference of power-ups like active camo and OS into the equipment system feels more like an an attempt to pad out a relatively small roster of pickups more than anything else. So the whole system is very lopsided and is being carried by a couple of standouts, but again, because of how they are implemented, you can bolster these successes and feature them more while mitigating the effect of the less successful elements, which is a benefit to designing your game this way. Now we move on to the weapons, and this is huge. This is the bread and butter of the game, and most other people I have seen cover the sandbox do so in a very brief general sense. You'll hear nebulous feedback such as, you know, the guns feel good, or, or superficial presentation-based feedback such as they feel meaty, and oh man, that BR, man, it's, it's chunky, really great sound effects and, and, and impact, or everything feels useful. Just very surface-level analysis, heaping praise on a very new game, and that makes sense because on a surface level, yeah, this is 343's best sandbox. They have made a very clear attempt at minimizing redundancy in this game. This is seen in not only their willingness to cut existing weapons if their role was considered already filled by something else, but also in an attempt to make the new weapons added far more interesting and functionally diverse. For instance, when they were making weapons for Halo 4, redundancy wasn't just present, it was basically a design goal. They made a Forerunner battle rifle, a Forerunner shotgun, a Forerunner sniper, an SMG, a rocket, etc., and they did nothing but muddy the sandbox, while offering very little new game gameplay, and taking the spot of additions that could potentially be far more interesting. For example, in Infinite, the additions are far more interesting. The heat wave shoots out a compact burst of bouncing projectiles, but it can also have the shot rotated on its axis to fire horizontally or vertically. The Ravager is a gun I really like, in theory. <laughs> it's got an arcing three-round burst of explosive shots, but it has an interesting alt fire that lets you charge it up and create a damaging AoE, which is a cool wrinkle for the 
the gun. The skewer is satisfying and hard to use, and notice how the laser isn't present because it isn't needed anymore. The skewer fills that role. So here's something that's really important, and it will be a key mindset you need to tap into for this next part. But I view the sandbox as a singular entity, and I judge it as a whole, not as a collection of individual pieces. I do not consider the lack of a carbine missing content because there are plenty of weapons that fill its role. I don't consider the beam rifle being gone missing content because it was never really that necessary due to the sniper's existence, and besides, it has missed entries in the past anyway. Now, minimizing redundancy does not mean you can't have multiple weapons in similar roles. The goal is more so to make sure those weapons are at least functionally distinct from one another, so that even if they get the same job done, they get them done in distinctive ways, but also to help ensure that when new sandbox elements are added, they are done so with the intention of creating new gameplay. Right, the gravity hammer when it was added in Halo 3 entered a CQC space that already had multiple weapons residing in it, but its ability to manipulate the sandbox in the way it can with its gravity altering mechanic made it functionally distinct. So to me, that's the actual point of those who argue for limiting redundancy. It's not strictly to remove things or take things away, but to actually encourage more functional variance and distinction between the pieces of the sandbox to actually create more. So even though Infinite still has weapons that occupy the same role, per se, it is also very clear that this sandbox has the most mechanical variance of any sandbox 343 has ever made. And that is a really good thing. And you can see it being received very well by just about everybody. But that idea of viewing the sandbox as a whole has led me to the opinion that this sandbox is critically flawed in its current condition. Because while you might be able to look at most guns in isolation and consider them to feel useful or sound good or feel good, I do not think they work good together. And it is not, in my opinion, something that can be fixed with just a nerf here or a nerf there, you know, buff that a little bit. It will, in my opinion, require a complete reconsideration on 343's part regarding how they view weapon balancing. So keep that in mind if you see certain changes in the future, even with some of the guns we're going to talk about. Beneath the surface of an admittedly strong lineup of weapons is what I believe to be an insidiously poorly designed sandbox. And once the dust settles and the honeymoon phase ends and it comes time for the level of scrutiny to increase and the true status of this game takes shape, the people will start to feel the negative effects of the things I'm about to talk about. And it may even be subconscious, but they will be felt. So what am I talking about? Well, I'll start with the most controversial gun in the game the assault rifle, with some saying, oh, thank God, it's finally useful, and others saying, oh, God, it's, it's too useful. This has led to a lot of toxicity, and I have seen my fellow colleagues, quite frankly, a little scared to even talk about it. To even suggest that the AR might be too powerful in its current condition has to be downplayed or mentioned in passing, minimized and baby-proof to the point where it feels like a footnote as to not upset anyone. So listen to me very carefully. You can dismiss it, you can ignore it, you can mock it, you can turn this video off and crawl into whatever echo chamber you choose to frequent and cackle amongst your like-minded peers about it, but I'd really, really appreciate you if you just sit down, keep an open mind, and let me explain to you why you're wrong. Because the assault rifle is overpowered, but not in isolation as a singular entity, but rather as a symptom for how the sandbox is constructed as a whole. We're gonna be here a while, so let's fucking do this shit. There are two major areas of concern I'd like to focus on, and it is in the relationship between a weapon's ease of use and effective range. Now, I am of the position that weapons should weight their balancing with far more consideration to the former than the latter. To me, it's obvious. I don't know why it's controversial to say that inherently easy to use weapons should not outperform weapons that require more skill than them, given that the player using the skill-based weapon is proficient. To me, that's just a matter of integrity. Skill-based weapons should reward players for using them proficiently. If skill-based weapons are consistently losing to guns that are easier to use than them, then I consider that a lack of integrity within the game. That idea is actually controversial, and I acknowledge that. The idea being that easier to use weapons are 
dominated by precision weapons, and thus their value within the sandbox is negated, and so instead, many believe weapons should be balanced around their effective range. And it is very obvious that 343 is of this mindset as well, and this is what they have done. Bear in mind, this is not an all or nothing either or situation. Even balancing that favors ease of use will still consider range in the equation, but what I'm trying to say is that effective range is currently a prominent and overly weighted metric when determining a weapon's role and their effectiveness within it for 343 and Halo Infinite. The logic for it is that balancing weapons around their effective range means you can ensure every weapon is useful, with the two poster childs for this idea being the AR and BR. Oh yeah, you know, the AR dominates close range and the BR wins mid range. Now both are useful instead of the BR winning every time, and that means it's balanced. Surface level, great idea, makes a ton of sense. Now, every gun feels worth picking up because every gun or weapon has a little range niche where they are designed to be a dominant option. Here's the problem with this and the problem with weapon roles being too significantly defined by their range. It ignores ease of use. The AR wins close range fights because it's a close range gun, and the BR wins mid range fights because it's a mid range gun, but they do not require an equal level of skill to achieve proficiency within those roles. Even within a BR's effective range, it is still a precision weapon. It still requires more skill to fulfill its role than an AR does to fulfill its role. This means that close range weapons not only have the inherent advantage bestowed upon them by 343's effective range design philosophy, but they are all, by their very nature, easier to use as well. This means the significance of gun skill is significantly reduced in close range encounters, because the weapons that are effective within that range require far less gun skill inherently. And because they are designed to win that engagement, when you bring the skill-based weapon in, the skill-based weapon loses the majority of those encounters simply because they are designed to be less effective within that range. And I'm not saying a BR has never beaten AR before, or it's impossible to get kills with precision weapons at close range, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that easy to use guns are beating harder to use guns at a rate that is way too high and with far little room to outskill opponents simply because they are encountering one another at a certain range and I consider that a problem. But I'm sure some still don't. For instance, one might argue that's okay because even if gun skill takes a back seat to close range encounters, mental skill remains. The player who understands Halo better will still win. Now it's a skill of game knowledge and positioning. Okay, so here's why that's horrible. It encourages unhealthy playstyles. Think about it. If weapons are too defined by their effective range and you don't offer enough opportunities for other weapons to overcome that via gun skill, then you of course discourage people from taking fights that fall outside of their weapons effective range in general. This will eventually, when the game matures and optimization occurs, discourage map movement. Each weapon will have designated sections of the map that benefit its playstyle, and players will naturally try to stay in situations where their gun wins, because positioning is so heavily incentivized within Infinite's current sandbox structure. So mid to long range players will try to stay back, minimize opportunities for close range encounters to occur, and it will result in far more passive play. The opposite will happen for close range weapons. It will encourage players to bait close range encounters either via ambush or simply controlling the CQC spaces within a map, and you will see camping, passive play, and as I stated, unhealthy behavior. This shouldn't be difficult to understand. Think of the play styles that super easy to use close range weapons have typically encouraged in Halo's past. When a player gets a shotgun, do they go take fights in the middle of the map? No. They hide behind corners and wait. Was Halo 4's bolt shot not incredibly scrutinized and disliked? Why? It promoted an unhealthy play style. And while the AR might not be as powerful a barrel stuffer as the shotgun, it is still absurdly strong at close range, and it is also very strong up into the mid-range as well, while being one of the easiest guns in the game to use. Do you kind of see how that works? How over time, weapons that are too heavily balanced around range might create these tendencies? But now consider this. When you engage, say, a BR at mid to long range, and you don't have a weapon with a similar range to contest it, oh, you lose, right? The BR wins. That, that's where it's balanced to have the significant advantage. No, you don't lose. She'll take the fight. Why the hell would you ever 
take a BR on at the range it is designed to dominate in. You don't engage. Your ability to escape or avoid mid to long range encounters unless you've put yourself in an extremely compromised position is very high. But now we go back to the assault rifle. If you find yourself in a close range engagement against an assault rifle and you don't have a close range weapon, your ability to escape that encounter is very unlikely. Your ability to avoid that situation is way lower, unless of course you avoid those sections of the map entirely, which was my previous point. You can usually outright avoid confrontations at mid to long range if you choose to, but at close range, good luck. And that ties in to the unhealthy playstyle point. In Halo Infinite, you can, and literally all you have to do is choose to do this, use an assault rifle, avoid fights outside of its range, and manipulate encounters to its favor. And if you can isolate encounters where you get people within an assault rifle's effective range, you put players in a situation where they are borderline helpless. And it was one thing when you could set up an ambush to get a quick spray and close in to finish people off with a melee. The infinite AR can make you feel helpless at a significantly further range than it should. And its ability to manipulate encounters in its favor and avoid encounters that typically won't win is very easy to achieve. This is anecdotal, but I had a live stream a few weeks back where I challenged viewers to 1v1 me using any weapon of their choice. I would use an assault rifle and they could choose any weapon they liked other than the assault rifle or a power weapon. I 1v1'd against sidekicks, commandos, stalker rifles, BR users on both PC and controller, and I won all but a single game. The only game I lost was against an Onyx level controller player using a BR. I lost by one kill that I threw in the final seconds, and when I rematched that same player, another close game that I had a guaranteed victory in if I just stayed back. But you know what? He'd been such a great sport that at the very end, I accepted a mid-range challenge to give him the opportunity to tie, and this happened. Yeah, it, was just a, it was honestly a choke point on that. You want me to challenge yeah, from here? Challenge it. Oh my god, get wrecked, bro. Get wrecked, absolutely. No way. I challenged it. You gotta give me the pulse. <laughs> you gotta... How did I win all of these games? It's easy. I avoided fights I would have surely lost. I won way more fights at mid-range than I should have because the AR is too strong, and I manipulated encounters to my favor. I put my opponent in positions where they could not easily escape and were forced to try and outshoot me, which is an option Infinite currently does not adequately support. Now, this dynamic of course changes in a live 4v4 map that may even have objectives that forced you to action in various ways, but if I could win these games literally just by positioning myself into easy fights. Can you not see that this might be a problem in a live game? When I'm not the sole focus, when you can't just play to keep me out of range, when you're pushing an objective or avoiding another player and you run inside and I'm waiting there with my fucking bullshit rifle? So the one sentence Twitter crowd saying the assault rifle's fine, uh, it's finally useful, go play Halo 3 if you want a one gun game. As you could see, I could not fit my response in a tweet. I'd like to think I've done a fairly decent job of explaining why the assault rifle should simply not be this powerful because balancing too heavily around effective range and not enough around ease of use creates a ton of issues. Not surface level issues, which is why this is so scary for the game's future, but underlying, insidious, not immediately apparent issues that completely skated by the initial feedback of the game. Oh man, you know, 343 nailed the gameplay, but that gosh darn progression system is the only thing holding it back. Maybe not. But now we move into phase two of our sandbox discussion, because like I said, the assault rifle is just a symptom of a bigger issue. It's just an effective catalyst for the discussion and a good example of some of these concepts at play. But now we gotta talk about the battle rifle. And I'll be the first to admit that the BR in past Halo games has had its issues, and honestly different issues depending on the game. So if I were to tell you that Infinite's BR is fucked, I'm not absolving past incarnations of their sin. With that being being said, Halo Infinite's BR is fucked, and once again in a scary, not immediately apparent way. So now it's time for BR fans to keep an open mind, because plot twist, this isn't an AR versus BR segment. It's not about one or the other. I think both are incredibly flawed, because to reiterate, the issues with this sandbox are far deeper than a couple balancing tweaks here and there. 
Now, as we stated, the AR is way too powerful for how easy it is to use, and that it feels like it doesn't give skill-based precision weapons a big enough opportunity to compete. The fact that this is true and the BR, the de facto competitive-oriented skill weapon, is also too easy to use is mind-fucking to me. The gun is a precision weapon, yes, it's not devoid of skill, but the margin of error it grants you is absolutely ginormous. It's a four-shot kill if the last shot is a headshot, that's the same as usual. It is basically a hitscan gun. Now, whether that's achieved through an actual hitscan system or through extremely fast projectiles, I don't care, because the point is that functionally, you point and shoot. There's no significant shot-leading mechanic or anything like that. They have also decided to give the gun substantial and self-resetting vertical recoil. This is not some skill testing recoil management situation. This recoil actively aids you while using the BR and increases your margin of error significantly. If you just aim at an enemy's chest or center of mass, the BR's recoil will basically autocorrect to the head. It is so drastic that you can literally be aiming at somebody's elbow and the game will reward reward you with a headshot. Now, this will vary depending on what position your target is in, which direction they are walking, etc., but absolutely no one can deny that this is significant compensation at work. And will players be aiming at someone's elbow four times in a row? No, but keep in mind, only the final shot is really what matters. And if that final shot can be so inaccurate that it can be fired at somebody's elbow and still reward the player with a headshot, then yeah, I think that's a problem. If you are strafing and you you have good movement and the player can literally just intentionally not aim at your head to increase their lethality or worse they miss and get rewarded anyway I don't think that's good design at all with this BR every player might as well have a jack-in-the-box for a head and no wonder it feels so good when it is horrifically over rewarding players in its current incarnation but there's more way more this game has a pretty decent strafe. It's, it's honestly, it's quite gnarly and it lets you crouch strafe as well. When you are up close and personal, weapons like the AR can basically ignore this, but when fighting close quarters, I'd say you can certainly outmaneuver this BR and throw off its shot. The problem is, as you journey into the BR's effective range that 343 have designated for it, you not only strongly mitigate the strafe because objects that are farther away require less input to track naturally, but the aim assist for it is tremendous. Now this may be console exclusive, and I've heard a lot of talk about console aim assist being so significant that PC players feel disadvantaged, which I'm sure must feel like quite the role reversal, but it's basically asymmetrical balancing, which is an issue in its own right. And the aim assist given to a controller player lowers the skill gap of this gun to a severe degree which will affect every lobby that a controller player is present in. And it is most notable in that mid-range, which is where 343 wants you to use the gun. It has tons of friction, it makes tracking way easier, and when you add it all up, you have a gun that gets its shot to the target near instantly with a built-in compensator to allow a much larger margin of error to achieve headshots on top of very generous aim friction that tracks targets with minimal player input required. And there will be moments where you are firing at a opponent and they are strafing and ducking and returning fire and you can just pull the trigger four times and they might as well have been standing still. The issue isn't that the gun takes no skill but it should take more skill. There should be more input required and there should be a larger variance of results. And the fact that this is the premier starting weapon for the competitive playlist is problematic because I don't think it does a good enough job at determining the better player. The guy who hits the chest is rewarded just as much as the guy who hits the head in a lot of instances. And sometimes aiming at the chest actually rewards you more because the recoil might travel too far up and not credit you with a headshot at all. Now, now, misguided people may try to argue that, oh, you know, that's just an added skill gap of the gun. You need to have the knowledge and understanding to account for that recoil and aim lower. Aiming for the chest and using the recoil to your advantage in order to get the headshot is just another technique to learn, and that's skill.
Uh, no, it isn't. Aiming at a larger target over a smaller target will never increase the skill gap of your game. To benefit from aiming at the chest, where you not only benefit from the recoil leading you into the headshot, but you also have a larger safety net for poor accuracy, naturally there's a larger hitbox around your reticle, so if you're not perfectly centered, you'll still probably get some damage in. While aiming for the head, if you're off target, you may just miss the player entirely. Think of it like this. Imagine you're in an arc Arcade playing skee ball and they switched the 100 point goals with the 40 point goal why would you ever aim for the harder to hit target now when it is not only worth less points but it has no safety net either you're gonna aim for the 100 that is now in the middle every single time and if you're off a little bit no problem you're still probably getting some points and that's your premier competitive starting weapon for Halo Infinite in a nutshell and what's even crazier is that even if you miss and you have suboptimal aim, this gun will still shred you. And we always think about these things as 1v1 encounters, but in a 4v4 game when everybody's team shotting, even suboptimal shots will absolutely melt you. And that's why we need to talk about TTK. Now, the perfect kill time of the BR is about 1.55 seconds. That's pretty long for a perfect, in my opinion, too long. But the problem is, in its current incarnation, I think the gun is too easy to use to make it kill any faster. The main result you want to achieve when balancing the kill time of a precision weapon is you want a really healthy gap between that perfect kill time and an average kill time, which is not just body shots, but missed shots as well. The larger the gap, the more ability you have to out play your opponent. The more health you will have left on average after an encounter if you have optimal accuracy, the more ability you have to take on multiple opponents at once, you will have more agency, you will have more variance. And the way this is achieved is via skill, or more accurately, via the weapon's productivity being directly linked to an individual player's skill. And here's a really cool thought. Guns that are balanced with a big variance in their kill times helps you balance other guns as well. Now guns that are easy to use, instead of making them useless, which I do not want, you can slot them within that variance. You give them an advantage while still allowing the precision weapon user to overcome that advantage via gun skill. I only think that works if the gap is significantly large enough for both weapons to feel satisfying and useful. To me, that works much better than leaving it up to who's got the right gun for whatever proximity the encounter happens to be occurring within. If a gun is hard to use, then its average kill time will be significantly higher than whatever its perfect kill time is. If you do not adequately punish suboptimal player skill or performance, then you push the perfect and average kill times closer together. If you do not have a large enough damage disparity between body shots and headshots and less accurate shots only do a little less damage than perfect shots, the gap shrinks. If you reward center of mass shots as if they were headshots, the gap shrinks. If you have too high of aim friction enabled at mid-range so a player's ability to effectively strafe shots is negated, your gap shrinks. And if you combine all of that with bullets that travel very fast that do not need to be led, the gap shrinks. And you end up with a weapon that will not hold up to years of competitive play, that will not promote mastery and dedication to the game, that will not adequately reward superior players to the degree that they should be rewarded. And the game loses depth. This is a big reason players like myself push for projectile weapons with true noticeable bullet travel and shot leading mechanics. If you have a projectile precision weapon, then in close encounters, when the projectiles don't really come into play, your strafe, as we already discussed, is naturally the most effective it will be. Any movement will require more reaction. As targets get farther, players will have to calculate that and lead their shots accordingly, which increases the skill gap and also makes strafing remain effective at longer distances. You can keep the kill time exactly the same or even make it faster while pushing the average kill time further because it's harder to achieve. But here's the really cool shit. This works way better at determining a weapon's effective range as well. You can make a weapon less effective at range by just making it harder to use at range. This also complements map design and allows you to utilize more open layouts because if weapons are harder to use at a distance, then it's much harder for them to melt you and thus allows for more map traversal. Open layouts in Halo Infinite with its BR? Yeah, not super fun, and now you know why. The solution isn't, oh man, you know, don't do BR starts in BTB or open maps like Behemoth because the BR is a laser beam. The solution is fix your BR.
Let's consider a couple projectile weapons currently in Halo Infinite, like the Heat Wave. Everybody would consider that to be a close range gun. Why? Does it have some bullshit spread that activates after a certain distance? No, it is theoretically just as powerful across the map as it is two feet from someone, but it is way harder to hit someone across the map to the point where it isn't even considered viable. But that natural dynamic that occurs, where the farther a target is, the more skill that is required, is really good and still allows the opportunity for incredible plays. If you were to get a long distance kill with the heat wave, that would feel incredible. Same with the Mangler. It has a very slow projectile with bullet drop. It's a super satisfying gun to use that is not as viable at long range just because it's hard to use the farther an opponent is. Instead, 343 likes to balance effective range with mechanics like Bloom. Now, Bloom is, in in my opinion, not as prevalent or as big of an issue as it was back in, say, Vanilla Reach, where it influenced a lot of important guns in the game, but it is probably the most prominent it has been since then here in Halo Infinite. And I'd like to draw your attention to some of 343's own words here. For context, these are some responses they made to feedback in one of their tech tests, and it should help us get a glimpse at their mindset. Keep in mind, this is in response to feedback regarding the concern of Bloom's presence in the game, specifically around the sidekick in Commando. Bloom, or accuracy decay due to poor trigger discipline, especially on precision weapons, is always a lively conversation. During this tech preview, we saw people not mind Bloom and others dislike it, with most of the talk focusing on the VK-78 Commando and the MK-50 Sidekick. From what we saw in people's gameplay and in the data, both performed well in their intended ranges. So this is just a little validity to my previous arguments that this is a very key balancing component to them. Here you have two weapons of concern, and 343's response is that, well, you know, in their intended ranges they seem fine. In fact, so fine they ended up nerfing the commando. But if it wasn't obvious based on everything we've talked about, here's a little snippet from the horse's mouth that this is a big component to how they process things, and a big reason why Bloom is more prevalent in this game. So let's break this down a bit. They describe Bloom as accuracy decay due to poor trigger discipline. It is very clear by this terminology that they consider Bloom a punishment or a negative, and a lot of people might agree with that. The idea of Bloom is that it encourages you to pace your shot so that you can remain accurate at a distance. And there are of course moments where this works as intended and you get these really satisfying well-timed shots and you kill your opponent and you know, awesome, mission accomplished. The problem is Bloom isn't a downside. It isn't a negative. It is simply a trade-off. You lose accuracy, yes, but you gain an increased fire rate and accelerated damage output. Your perfect kill time, if you will, is dictated not by skill, but by RNG via Bloom. And there are simply too many situations where choosing the faster fire rate is the best strategic decision. And when the best strategic decision involves players relying on RNG and willfully forfeiting their personal skill-based influence on the weapon, then that weapon will simply never have integrity. Here's a couple of examples. If you have two bloom weapons fighting each other and one bloom weapon gets the jump on the other and begins to pace their shots, if the other player decides, oh crap, I'm way behind, I have to spam the trigger to have a chance, any situation that the spamming player wins feels like absolute shit for the player using the gun quote unquote correctly. And I'd venture to guess the player who benefited from the good bloom RNG probably doesn't feel too great, or at least not in a meaningful way that will sustain their interest in the game long term. Or here's a more specific example. Technically, the sidekick has a faster perfect TTK than Infinite's assault rifle, but we've already talked about the insane ease of use and damage potential of the AR. So when someone gets a jump on you with that and you have your sidekick out, it may very well be within your best interest to spam the trigger as fast as you can for the chance to out DPS your opponent. Basically, praying for bullshit to beat bullshit. And if we want to add another line to the assault rifle's resume, it has wide but very fast resetting bloom and also does bonus damage for headshots. So as you spray your bullshit cannon, you can get some good RNG, hit those headshots, and then just randomly kill people faster sometimes. Better yet, just feather the trigger over their head because the bloom resets almost instantly to increase your odds a bit. Bloom creates too many outcomes that are inherently unsatisfying. It takes one of a player's most prominent attributes in influencing the game, aiming, and trades it for chance. 
there are simply just better ways to balance guns. Again, instead of Bloom being introduced to make hitscan or functionally hitscan guns balanced at long range by decreasing their damage output, you can just make the gun harder to use, preferably via projectiles, which Infinite does do for some of its guns, and those guns are fun to shoot. See, it's all connected. Everything we've talked about is linked together via a fundamental philosophy that 343 has. Effective range, ease of use, bloom, time to kill, they all influence one another to create the sandbox as a whole. Hell, even the sniper rifle reflects this. If you are unscoped and you fire the sniper rifle too fast, it will have bloom specifically when it is unscoped. Why? Well, 343 says it's to ensure that the sniper rifle is used as a long range weapon. They introduced close range bloom because they are so obsessed with effective range, even though it is completely unnecessary. Why? Because the sniper rifle is hard to use. You don't need to give it bloom because it's difficulty balances at close range. It's freaking hard to hit those shots. If you hit them, you deserve them. But our priorities and balancing are so out of whack that we are actually tuning weapons to be less satisfying simply to adhere to this effective range philosophy. And we're doing it on guns like the sniper rifle, one of the most difficult and historically satisfying guns in the series. The sniper is not defined by its range. It's defined by its skill. It is a one-shot kill across the map, and it is a one shot kill two feet from your target. Its effectiveness at any range should be determined by how effective you are with it. So what are we really dealing with? Just, just a couple tweaks here and there? I don't think so. I think this sandbox has weighted far too much towards balancing around ranges. I believe this has caused more important attributes such as ease of use to be incorrectly considered. I think the time to kills are completely out of whack, and I absolutely believe that this will be felt by players consciously or subconsciously as time goes on if it hasn't started to happen already. I get it. There's a lot of good surface level things about this sandbox, but underneath is a very dangerously balanced game. Dangerous in that it feels good initially and thus might discourage further scrutiny, all the while its flaws are still there and it eats away at the game below the surface until you are left with nothing but a hollow shell. Here's some rapid fire thoughts with all of those beliefs I laid out providing context. The AR is too powerful. The BR is too easy and still loses somehow. If you fix one, it breaks the other even more. They will have to be fixed simultaneously. The heat wave is cool, but is completely outclassed by easier to use guns. The Ravager is super interesting from a functional standpoint, but feels borderline useless in this sandbox. The Plasma Carbine has horrible tracking, which actually makes you less accurate than wouldn't be fun even if it was good. The Mangler is an awesome projectile weapon, but is so hard to use at range that it is also getting outclassed and is disappointingly now primarily touted as a beatdown weapon. The sniper has unnecessary close range bloom, the pistol has bloom, the commando has bloom and feels way underpowered outside of a few niche scenarios, the bulldog is underwhelming, the disruptor rarely wins straight up fights and relies on dotting enemies after death or after running away, which isn't a great playstyle to encourage anyway, the plasma pistol might as well not exist, the stalker rifle, hard as fuck to use in a game dominated by easy to use weapons. Is it fixable? Theoretically, sure. But it's going to be really tough, especially when I believe the sandbox needs drastic changes while the rest of the fan base thinks it's great. It's going to be hard to implement changes without rocking the boat, but for starters, we need to get the AR's kill time down, perhaps with a slight damage nerf and by removing its headshot damage. And we need to make the BR harder to use, and I'd start with eliminating its vertical recoil because it helps more than it hinders you, which damages the integrity of the gun. This is a start that might alleviate the pressure a bit before more changes can be made and pressure is an interesting thing to consider because after all this all these points that explain my position i'm still expecting a handful of people to disregard them with a simple you yeah, know who cares enjoy the game stop whining or this this would ruin the game because it would make it too sweaty sounds like a competitive sweat fest to me it would hurt the experience for casual players and it's sad that Halo, a game that excels at pleasing both sides, has somehow convinced its audience that it can only do one or the other. You know what makes a game feel sweaty? It isn't a powerful battle rifle or an emphasis on skill. It's 
pressure. It's when easy function is overly effective. It's when you walk into a room and get shot by an AR and it feels like you have no chance. It's when you feel like you can't walk into semi-open parts of the map because an easy to use BR will foreshot you with minimal effort. What's ironic is that increasing the skill gap of the gun would decrease the pressure it puts on you due to additional room for operator error. It would increase your survivability and confidence when moving throughout the map, making the gun more competitive would actually make it feel less sweaty in a lot of circumstances, because weapons with integrity feel better. They feel better to use, and they feel better to lose to. If your casual audience refuses to play the game because your weapons have too much integrity, they're not staying anyway, because you can't lose the aspect of your game that encourages dedication from your player base in order to keep people playing longer. It's paradoxical. You can't compromise your game for a casual audience, but even more importantly, Halo can already support a casual audience without compromise. Because Halo, if designed right, is good at fucking everything. You know what casuals like? Custom games. If players don't like competitive settings, no problem. Halo is one of the most accessible, casual, friendly video games in the history of video games. It offers so many options, so many modes of play, that it is actually mind-boggling. If you don't want to get destroyed by BRs over and over again, no problem. We have Hammer Hill. Not a fan of hammers? Okay, what about Rocket Race? Perhaps sumo wrestlers might suit your fancy. How about Jenga? Or Duck Hunt? Or Trash Compactor? Or Fat Kid? Or Cops and Robbers? Or Juggernaut? Or Griffball, for Christ's sakes. But oh wait we have a problem. You know what all of those modes have in common? Some of them being absolute classics? Not a single damn one of them is currently available in Halo Infinite. Not one. And thus we have reached the final section of our video. The final piece of the Halo puzzle, and for some the most important. For some, their primary Halo experience resides within this section right here. Modes, options, content. It is a crying shame that one of the biggest criticisms of Halo 5, its lack of content on launch, has not been addressed. Infinite is absolutely content light. It is missing key features and modes, and many of the features that are present are either not as in-depth as before, or in some cases just completely busted. We are missing Forge, Infection, Assault, King of the Hill, there's no VIP or Juggernaut-esque mode, there's no race, theater is in, but it's broken again, and even stuff like custom games don't work properly. They crash, they don't always start with the correct settings causing you to restart the build, and they're missing a ton of options that they used to have. You can't enable regenerating grenades. You can't decide to spawn specific weapons or weapon groups on the map. You can't decide to spawn specific vehicle or vehicle groups on the map. This is super frustrating, especially if there is, say, a specific vehicle you want to play with, and even more so when you consider Infinite uses more of a rotation for its spawning, where different vehicles and weapons will spawn at the same location from round around. It's also disappointing they didn't consider their biggest addition to the game equipment for custom games either. This is such fertile ground for awesome modes. If you could let players spawn with equipment and allow us to edit their properties like increasing the charges on a grappling hook or its distance, editing the impact of a repulsor, or toggling attributes with a thrust, kind of like the ability in the campaign that turns you invisible when you thrust, an opportunity completely squandered. There's no traits when capturing or holding a stronghold. There's no oddball carrier traits, even though capture the flag has flag carrier traits. You know, it's just, it's just not good enough. I don't feel the need to list every little thing. Actman actually made a good video about this, kind of outlining a lot of these issues as well. And so if you want a bit more on this, I'll go ahead and link that in the description for y'all to watch. But instead, I want to shift our focus to another issue that all of this missing content relates to. Because typically, simply pointing out that content is missing is followed by a bunch of excuses. Oh, you know, just wait, it'll be here eventually. It's free to play. It's a new business model. Stop complaining. And look, I get wanting to be positive positive but it does not benefit you to advocate for less. It does not make the game better for you to fight the people who fight for more. And the people fighting for more are perfectly justified in their grievance because they are fighting for things that Halo used to have on day one. So it doesn't matter if it eventually gets added however many months down the line. We should absolutely, as consumers, 
advocate for more content, especially content Halo once had as a standard. And the game now being free to play, even if it's a reason, it does not absolve the game. Just because you have an excuse for why it's worse doesn't make it any better. And if it's worse than before, then we should absolutely call that out. If making Halo free to play means it has to lose a ton of content that makes it special, then perhaps Halo is worse as a free to play game. If you accept less, expect even less next time. And here's the important thing. It's not just that this game has a ton of missing content. It's that the culmination of its missing content means the game's entire infrastructure is inferior to the Halo games that came before. And what that means is that the influence of a system or a feature extends far beyond just the missing feature itself. Let's use Forge as an example. Now, we were told a while in advance that Forge wouldn't make it in for launch. And sure, you can give 343 a little golf clap about their transparency and honesty, but I also think that should be accompanied by a god fucking damn it. That's really not good. Sure, it wasn't ready. I get it. It should have been a priority to be ready. I believe Forge and a lot of the things I'm about to mention are absolutely essential to Halo's identity. And the fact it and so many of the custom game features were not present tells me that 343 does not currently value them as much as they should. They should be considered essential to the game's infrastructure because of the influence it has on the game as a whole. For instance, I saw some people shrug off Forge's exclusion as just, oh, you know, well, I don't really use that anyway. You don't have to use Forge for it to matter to the game as a whole. Firstly, it is a really cool tool that offers an outlet to the creative subset of your community. You can be completely incompetent at first person shooters and not spend a single second in matchmaking. Maybe you don't feel comfortable, you just don't like to compete, and yet still spend hundreds of hours playing Halo and involving yourself in the community just because you like to build things. But even if you don't spawn a single item in Forge for your entire Halo career, it influences your experience. I'd argue that some of Halo's greatest custom games are made possible with Forge. Literally any mode that requires a custom curated map to function has to have it. But what about the competitive scene? Earlier in this video, I talked about how Halo Infinite didn't have enough creativity in its map design and needed more interesting concepts. I can completely understand if there were a few competitive players who heard me say that and went, you know, I... I don't know about that. Uh, the more crazy the maps are, the less competitive they might be. There might not be enough maps for high level play. Well, if your map selection could use a little bump, Forge can be used to bolster the ranks. I don't think it should be relied on, but if you need a couple more competitive maps, then Forge can absolutely be utilized just like it was in, say, Halo 3, when it added Forge maps like Amplified and Onslaught. It bolsters matchmaking overall. Popular modes can be featured in special playlists like Action Sack. It's used in Machinima to create custom sets. It's even used for training. You can go onto a map and spawn whatever tools you want to practice with, practice whatever jumps you want to try out, and easily reset yourself by going into monitor mode. It does so much for your game, it's staggering. Whether you like to build, play the game competitively, have a tool to make practicing easier, and absolutely, if you want a fantastic tool to generate custom game content, content and new experiences that often are super casual and appealing to all players. Forge is more than just one mode. It is the lifeblood of a truly infinite amount of experiences, and it's painfully ironic that Halo Infinite doesn't have it during its launch window, when it would have influenced the greatest possible amount of people. So then you consider a mode like Infection. Will it be added to the game? I'm sure it will, somewhere down the line. But will Forge be in the game yet? Because 90% of the most popular infection modes utilize Forge in some way. Most of the famous custom games that use infection as a foundation are played on custom maps. But then the next question is, will infection have the options it needs? Because currently custom games are incredibly buggy and lacking in options like we addressed. So you see, it's not good enough to just add infection because the game's entire infrastructure is not what it needs to be. The game is not set up to properly allow allow all of its content to influence one another, and having that foundation in place is far more important than having just any one game mode added. Let's break it down like this. Look at one game mode, Griffball. 
It could not be more simple at a surface level, but it is a product of Halo's infrastructure. Its map was made in Forge. It wasn't complicated. They walled off the sides of Foundry and added spawn points on each side. They went into custom games, used the assault game type, and built a variant of it where they altered the attributes of the player and the ball carrier to fit their needs. Then they shared that mode via a file share system where people could easily download it even from the lobby because the game actually had a pre-game lobby. If you joined a match and liked the mode you were playing, you could go into custom games and there was a recently played tab that you could access it from. And then as it spread and the mode became popular, it was eventually added into matchmaking where it was able to be accessed and experienced by even more people. And today, it's basically considered a mode all on its own. And for some, it became their favorite way to play the game. Some Halo players made it their primary activity. It spawned its own sub-community, with its own website and forums discussing it. More variants were created using Forge and additional options. Tournaments were held, some for even prize money. And all of that was generated because of one variant of Assault. That's how much power and influence all of these things truly have on Halo. One simple variant of a mode that isn't even all that popular literally created an entire sub-community within Halo, and it was possible because of Halo's infrastructure, the combination of options and social features. And that is what Infinite truly needs to consider, because what I'm anticipating is that at some point we will get Griffball as well. But far too often, 343 just looks at the end result and they just build that. We have to pick a completely separate mode to play Fiesta because they did that instead of adding a random weapon option in Slayer. We have to pick a completely separate mode to play FFA because 343 did that instead of just adding a team's toggle to the base Slayer mode. So so when they add Griffball, we're supposed to blow our kazoos and clap, but we need to really pay attention to the details. Because if you just add Griffball without the infrastructure, then you're not building Halo the right way. Right now, if you list all of the pieces that were used to build Griffball, Halo Infinite is lacking in just about all of them. There's no Forge, no Assault, a precedent of limited custom game options, a lack of social features such as the pregame lobby, limited methods of accessing user-created or previously played content and that's a problem because even if you put Griffball in the game the game isn't built to curate the next Griffball, the next big thing the next great custom game that takes the halo community by storm and so now i ask you is this really a good foundation for the next 10 years because i don't think it is we talk about oh it'll get at it eventually it's the free to play model but drip feeding all of these features a little bit at a time doesn't solve this issue it is a strength to have all of this content available at launch because when it is all present, then all of these pieces of content can influence each other and ultimately become more than the sum of its parts. This to me is an essential element of Halo. It is one of its greatest assets and differentiating features, its breadth of content, its limitless potential to constantly create an infinite amount of new experiences and share them with brilliant social features. It should be thought of as a defining attribute of the game, but in Halo Infinite, it is not. It is a weakness. In fact, it's a borderline afterthought and a clear indication that 343 doesn't see the connections. It is evident in how much they deemed non-essential and even more so in how they designed what is present. What's crazy is just the lost potential. I mean, to have a game like that, like what Halo started to become with Halo 3 and especially Halo Reach, to have that released today, to have all of that available in this age of streamers and Twitch and social media, the ability for it to combine with the advent of all of these social avenues to multiply the influence of these features exponentially, the crazy modes that could have been played on the countless live streams and the interactivity to bring viewers in and play. Oh my, it's, it's not even just that we dropped the ball, but if anything, this was the Halo game to go even bigger. Social media integration for file sharing, custom games browsers on day one, Posts highlighting all of the best user-created content with methods of downloading in-game. Instead, we launch with the worst infrastructure Halo has ever had. And even if someday, who knows how long from now, if someday they do finally get all of this stuff in the game, it will never change the fact that when this game launched, and surprise launched nonetheless, we had over 250,000 people playing it concurrently on its first day. And that's just the Steam charts alone. And Halo didn't have its best foot forward. We will never get that opportunity back. And now all we can do is hope that the content gets here, 
it gets here as soon as possible so that it can work together and that it gets implemented in the correct way. Because right now, and I hope I've done a decent job of showing you why I feel this way, 343 Industries is not building Halo correctly. They are not implementing content correctly. And at a fundamental level, literally the infrastructure and foundation of the game, Infinite is failing Halo's potential. So we have a decent set of core mechanics that, while not perfect, are certainly 343's best attempt at making a game feel like Halo. But then we have a limited map selection that completely lacks the creativity and variety of past Halo games. We don't have Forge to bolster that selection or to do any of the numerous things that Forge does. We have a severely flawed weapon sandbox and what is a sandbox driven game. We are missing important key features, missing tons of modes, missing tons of custom game options. And we have a Halo game that is supposed to last 10 years despite having one of the weakest foundations of any Halo game ever made. And I didn't even mention the stuff like the horrible progression system, the lack of playlists, the shitty customization, the atrocious in-game store, the lack of alternative progression systems, the terrible and potentially manipulative challenge system, issues with BTB not working properly, rampant cheating that 343 seems unprepared for, severe instances of desync, and so much more. And the reason I didn't mention that is because that stuff is so bad that even the people who have praised this game to high heavens took time to shit on it. So I'll just mention it in passing here. Everybody is in agreement that those things are bad, and I wanted to try and focus on other things, but when you take into account everything, both the issues I talked about and the more unanimous issues being discussed by the community at large, I don't think it's hyperbolic at all to call this game a disappointment. In fact, I think it's rather reserved. But I told you all when this video started that if you come in with an open mind, you will leave excited for Halo's future. Because despite all that I've said today, despite all of these problems and serious shortcomings that add up to what I believe is a severely flawed game that does not deliver on the potential of this franchise, despite all of it, people fucking love this game. Sure, you know, honeymoon phase and all that, but there's something about it that resonates with people. I mean, it's showing up on tons of 2021 best games lists. It's winning shooter of the year. I've seen it take home game of the year or best game of the year from some outlets. And it has garnered all of those accolades by being 10% of what Halo could be. A Halo operating at a fraction of its potential is blowing everybody's mind here in 2021. And I, as a Halo fan, can't help but think, holy shit. What could Halo do if it really brought its A game? What could Halo do if it came out day one as feature complete with all of these elements being addressed? Because I believe Halo can be so much better than this. And yet even just a small whiff of that wonderful Halo core is enough to elicit this incredibly positive response. And so yeah, that excites me because I feel vindicated. Because if anything, Infinite has proven that the core elements of Halo are ridiculously strong. So strong that even when unsupported, it not only resonates with modern gaming audiences, it knocks their fucking socks off. Do I think this game will decline and lose players? Yeah, that's why I made this. I, I don't think it's good enough. I think it has both underlying and immediately apparent issues that will cause players to put it down, and some of them won't even know why they don't want to play it anymore. They're so deeply buried in this game's design. But the core works. We know what to build on now. And if we can piece it all together, then Halo's potential is truly infinite. Halo finally has its heart back, and that blood of sandbox-driven design is now pumping through its veins again. We have a heading, a direction to follow, but if we act like we're already back, then we'll never actually be back. There is a future where Halo dominates the first-person shooter landscape simply by being itself. The bedrock this series was built on is just as sturdy as it was 20 years ago, and its potential is just as resonant today as it was back then. I don't know if Halo Infinite can survive long enough to become that game, but Halo Infinite has proven that that game could work. So are we back? No. We have a lot of work to do. But we're coming. And you can come too, but first we have to admit that we're not there yet. Till next time.